Uh, and so how do I intersect people where they are? One of the things I love about Jesus is he didn't just hang out in the synagogue. He didn't just like stay inside and wait for people to come to him. He went to them. He went to where they were. He intersected their lives with language, with stories, with experiences that made sense to them. They didn't always come to him. He went to where they were. And so understanding that, this is a model for me. So what I do now in developing leaders is I go to where they are. I know how to speak their language because I've been in leadership in the business world and in ministry world now for a couple of decades, right? I mean, pushing 30 years. So I can talk about all of this in different contexts and different perspectives and draw lines because every leadership principle is rooted in scripture. Please be so kind to support us by clicking the like button and subscribing to our channel to be notified of all future content. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this next episode of the KOG. That's the Kingdom of God Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Stephen Harris. And today on the show, I have Dr. William Attaway joining us, and he likes to go by William. So, William, how are you doing today? Stephen, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Absolutely. What, a, what an honor and a pleasure. I, I think you and I, in a sense, are cut from the same stone, you know, just getting to know you a little bit before we hit the record button here. Um, audience, you're in for a treat. I'll just give you a little bit of insight uh, about uh, William and what he does. So uh, Dr. William Attaway is a leadership coach for Catalyst Leadership, LLC, a company he founded to help leaders to intentionally grow and thrive. He has served in local church ministry for over 25 years and is currently the lead pastor of Southview Community Church, a church in Herndon, Virginia, near Washington, D.C., where he has served since 2004. He holds a Ph.D. in Old Testament with an emphasis in biblical backgrounds and archaeology. He loves to read and speak about leadership, organizational change, archaeology, and building up people and teams. His newest book is Catalytic Leadership, originally from Birmingham, Alabama, William now lives in Northern Virginia with his beautiful wife, Charlotte, and their two daughters. So that's what I have about you, sir. Please tell us a little bit about yourself from your own words. Yeah, I think if I, if I were to, to describe myself, I, I would use some of those words, but I've been a, a husband for almost 25 years to my wife. I have two teenage daughters uh, and have been a father now for almost 18 years. Wow. Uh, and those are pretty important roles in my life. Uh, most important of all, I'm a person of faith, I'm a follower of Jesus. And that informs every single part of my life. Excellent. Wow. I, I mean, just hearing you say that and the simplicity of it, you know, um, and, and reading the resume here is, is quite impressive. Again, you, having done this for a little while now and been in ministry for so many years prior to this, um, you learn a lot about a person when they're able just to be them and not have to add all those extra layers as a form of, <laughs> hey, I'm important. I want you all to know that. So <laughs> I appreciate having you here, <laughs> especially among Christians. You know, it's something I'm just a bit sensitive to. And so I really appreciate your, your, your humility in this. So thank you, sir. Oh, man, it's, it's an honor to be with you, really. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and the honor is, is definitely coming on my end towards you as well. And, and okay, you've got a church. Most people would say, okay, that's my gig. That's my full-time gig. You're a father, a husband. Okay, so you're pretty busy, but whoa, you got a PhD and you've got the side gig where you're teaching people about leadership. Please unpack this. What makes you you to do all these different things? You know, when I was 15 years old, I had a high school teacher who invited me to attend a leadership conference, my very first one. He saw something in me that I did not see in me. And I went and I listened and I learned and I was hooked. And I've been a student of leadership for over three decades now. And I think that that, that in, ignited a hunger in me as I begin to understand the power of this particular gift, this is one of the gifts that's listed in scripture. It's, it's a spiritual gift, wow. but it's not given to the individual just for them. It's given to them for the benefit of other people, like wow. every other gift. 
right? So how do I take what I'm learning and apply it first, but second, share what I'm learning with other people? And that's the journey that I've been on. Wow. Okay. So so prior to this, you talked about coming from a business background and going mm-hmm. to, to ministry after, you know, once God obviously called you in that direction. When I was sharing with you, I was the ministry guy who thought he was going to be a scholar and, you know, pastor, megachurch pastor, whatever, at least the aspirations I had, right? Yeah. To now God calling me towards business. What happened in your journey that made you want to go from business to ministry with that business uh, bent, so to speak? Now, I, I, I went into business and I had my first experience in leadership in a business perspective when I was 19 and I led my first team. I uh, moved from there through several different opportunities and ultimately ended up at a company called Bell South Mobility, where I worked and was there for several years and anticipated that being the end trajectory. I was going to stick this out and going to just continue to, to work through that organization. And then I met Jesus hmm. and everything in my life changed. Wow. Uh, and that's a whole story in and of itself. And so I, I had had a lot of training and a lot of opportunity to learn and grow. And then this, this whole life change happened. And I began to, to feel a, a tug and a call to help people in a different way. And so I began to explore that and ultimately made that transition. And, and that's where I moved into the ministry world. But the entrepreneurial gene that is in me never went away. Uh, And so how do I intersect people where they are? One of the things I love about Jesus is he didn't just hang out in the synagogue. He didn't just like stay inside and wait for people to come to him. He went to them. He went to where they were. He intersected their lives with language, with stories, with experiences that made sense to them. They didn't always come to him. He went to where they were. And so understanding that, this is a model for me. So what I do now in developing leaders is I go to where they are. I know how to speak their language because I've been in leadership in the business world and in ministry world now for a couple of decades, right? I mean, pushing 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I can talk about all of this in different contexts and different perspectives and draw lines because every leadership principle is rooted in scripture. All truth is God's truth. Sometimes we have to learn to eat the fish and leave the bones, right? We have to learn to discern. And when we do that, we can then make connections for anybody. Wow. That's powerful. Now, do you feel like you came out of the womb with this leadership capacity in you and you were just wired this way? (laughs) That's a great question. I I don't. I don't. I'm not what you would call the natural born extroverted charismatic leader. That is not my style. One of the things that I encourage my coaching clients to do is to discover their wiring, because I think every person's wiring is is a little bit unique. It's a little bit different because I think God created every person on purpose for a purpose. But you have to understand that you have to you have to understand and, and recognize that and lean into it and develop it. If you look at my profile on a Myers Briggs, for instance, I don't think I can get any farther on the introverted side of the line all the way. Right. Well, that's not typical for somebody who does what I do. Uh, That's not typical for somebody who does what I do in ministry. That's not typical for somebody who does what I do in business. And so how do you use that? How do you leverage that? Well, understand that every part of your wiring is there on purpose. And it's not a limitation. It's simply a matter of learning how to leverage it in such a way that you're going to lean into your own wiring instead of trying to copy and be someone else. Early in our leadership, so often we try to ape and mimic other leaders that we admire and respect. It's normal, it's natural. I did it. We all do it. Yeah. But you better over time learn to discover your own wiring and lean into that. Otherwise, you're just going to end up being a really bad copy of somebody else. The truth is God already made one of them. He doesn't need a bad copy on top of that. Wow. You're designed to be you. And that's what I love helping leaders to do. So I didn't pop out. I've learned, I've grown, I've developed, but I've learned to do that in the context of who I am, who I'm created and designed to be. Oh, that's huge. I I love what you're saying. I can say from my, even my own journey, I've experienced that because, I mean, I think about when I had the call of ministry on my life uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There were certain leaders, preachers that I aspired to be just like, and I started studying Mm -hmm. 
different things. Um, and it was always me trying to recreate myself in the image of somebody else. You know, we're not yeah. talking about being Christ-like. We're talking about, okay, this person has a certain swagger, a certain way they approach homiletically to the audience. That's, you know, how public speaking, basically, but from a Christian term, right? <laughs> How's yeah. the art of preaching? So, uh, you know, whether it's a certain style of homiletics, things like that, it was always a sense of trying to take bits and pieces of others and it was in my journey in corporate America when I realized that the best, per, the most effective I'm going to be is when I'm the best version of me, Bingo. my natural a way of approaching. Because now I'm making my living in the Medicare industry, and I learned to communicate to people from a, a, a conviction of always doing right by the customer as though it was my father or my mother talking to me. Mm. And That's good. I take that same approach on every call, whether I'm tired, wore out, full of energy, excited about life, discouraged, whatever. Every call is, you know, when I was on the phones was that, right? Out of that, I was successful, got promoted, was able to start training people to do that, then got promoted again. Now I'm leading teams of teams and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's really exciting to see that growth, but I had to have a personal conviction in my journey that I can only be Steven. That's right. I can pick up stuff from other people, yeah. principles. There might be certain little things, but at the end of the day, if I'm not Steven, we are having a problem. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Because then you're going to have a problem internally because you're trying to line up and become something that you are not designed to become. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really in interesting because... My question is, how much of this real world principle you're talking about? This is a one size fits all reality that spans mm -hmm. every element of human life. Yes. And you are in a church context, mm -hmm. but yet you play well. It's like the prophet Daniel, who is yeah. one of my top three biggest biblical heroes, right? Absolutely. He was a businessman who was a profound prophet, right? Been through some stuff, a political leader at that as well, right? But he knew how to speak the Babylonian language, but stay That's true right. to his God. That's right. I mean, tell me, do you see yourself having a certain element of that in what you do? I think so. I think it's important to learn to speak the language of the world we live in, the community that we live in. I think it's important to learn to speak in such a way that people understand. For too often, the church, too, too much of our history, the church has spoken words that people did not understand, that didn't connect with them where they were. And it just goes right over their heads. Well, no one likes to feel stupid. And so if you're talking in a way that make people feel stupid because they don't understand, they're going to dismiss you at best. Yeah. Uh, they're going to completely reject you at worst. <clears throat> I think we're called to something different. I think we're called to intersect people and, and help them, show them love, like Jesus taught us, right? To love one another. Well, how can I best do that? It's to treat people as individual creations of God, treat them as people who are created in his image, who are worthy of love and respect and honor. Yeah. And so that's what I do, whether it's as a pastor or whether it's as a leadership coach. Hmm. So I'm, I'm I'm just thinking from the practical side, how much of your 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 day or your week is dedicated to one or the other? Because both <laughs> in themselves are full time jobs, and then being a husband and a father. Sure, the, the pastoring is certainly the full time job that that gets the best hours of my week, no doubt. You know, and so I'm going to spend between forty and fifty hours every week focused on that. Um, what I do now as a leadership coach is taking increasingly more time as I have, you know, the opportunity to help more leaders. Most of my clients come from the, the government sphere, from government contractors and employees, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, C-suite leaders, educators. Uh, these are people that, that I'm able to intersect their worlds and help them develop as leaders in whatever their context, because leadership is, is not specific to one field. Principles don't just apply in this one field. It's not just in the church. It's not just in business. Leadership principles are principles for a reason. And you learn to eat the fish and leave the bones. You learn to say, okay, how is this going to apply in this context? And that's what I help leaders to do. I want them to be, like you said, the best version of themselves, not a copy of me mm -hmm. and certainly not a copy of anybody else. Wow. Now, are you, do you find that what tends to be typical Christian thinking, Christian, the subculture of Christianity, which <laughs> you and I are a part of, 
Sure. You feel that that brings expectations of even like mediocrity. Like a lot of people hold back from who God's called them to be simply because yeah. they're waving the Jesus flag. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I, I have railed against this for the entire time I've been in church ministry. <laughs> I, I believe so, so to the core of my being that excellence honors God and it inspires other people and mediocrity does neither. And yet in the church, we tend to be, you know, settle. We, we settle for mediocrity. We say, well, you know, it's good enough. Good enough is good enough. Okay. I don't know about you, but the God that I serve is worth a little bit more than that. Yeah. The people that he's called me to serve and to reach are worth a little bit more than that. They're created in his image. He literally sent Jesus to die for them. So yeah. mediocrity, good enough is good enough. That thinking has no place in the church. It has absolutely no place in the life of a leader. I don't care what you do or where you do it. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's time to step it up. <laughs> well, is there a couple of key principles that you think um, kind of go to the top of the list that you would share with the audience that if there's any two or three things, this is what you cannot compromise on kind of a thing? Absolutely. You know, in, in the book that I published earlier this year, uh, I talked about 12 key principles that I have pulled from my own journey and from the journeys of the leaders that I've coached for a couple of decades now. Mm -hmm. And these principles are ones that go across that spectrum, right? Educators, government employees, small business owners, C-suite execs, no matter where they are, these principles apply. The first one is the one that I say is the most important. This is the, this is foundational. And that is cultivation of a teachable spirit. If you don't have a teachable spirit, if you don't have a posture of continual learning, it doesn't matter what else on the list you get right. That's non-negotiable. Wow. And, and, you know, we're talking in the context of faith here today. And so in that context, I can tell you that the root of that is all throughout scripture. There's a great example, one that I'll teach on often from the book of Exodus. In Exodus 18, Moses has led the people through the wilderness, right? They're coming out of Egypt, out of slavery, into freedom. They've come through the wilderness. They're almost to Mount Sinai, where God is going to reveal himself and reveal his covenant with them in a very special way. But before they get there, the last stop is an encounter with his father-in-law, Jethro. Hmm. And, and as he encounters this, Jethro watches what he's doing, and he does what really all of us would appreciate. Because unsolicited advice from your father-in-law is really something that I think everybody can say, oh, yeah, please give me more of that, right? Mm -hmm. Jethro sees what Moses is doing. He's working himself into an early grave because he's doing everything himself. Yeah. And Jethro says, what you are doing is not good. This is not okay. He helps Moses to see what he can't see. When you are in the picture, it is really hard to get a sense of the whole picture. You can't see it because you're in the frame. You're in the weeds. You can't see the full perspective. It takes somebody from the outside to help you see what you simply cannot see. But it begins with a teachable spirit, being willing to hear that. What I love is what Moses said when Jethro approaches him, shares with him what he sees. It says, Moses listened hmm. and did all that Jethro said. That's humility. Yeah, that's a teachable spirit. And that is a model for me, for you, and for every person who is a person of faith. Yeah, and that's huge. I love the fact you're saying that because Moses was a man who was definitely effective in what he did. And yes, yes. I mean, Jethro gave him the advice and said, but, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, basically run it by God first to see mm -hmm. if he's on board with what I'm saying. Right. And then do it. It wasn't a, you better do it because I, you know, you're married right. to, you know, your exactly. my grandkids are your kids, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was a uh, go and ask God first before yes. you pull, you know, sign, sign on the dotted line here. And you look at the history of Moses after that, every time something came up, he would go to the Lord. Yes. The only time mm -hmm. he, he missed it is, you know, the first time God tells him to strike the rock years later, God tells him to speak to the rock and he strikes it because he's irritated. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I think that, right, what you just described is such an indicator of the kind of guy Moses was. Yeah. I wonder, and this is pure speculation, but I wonder if the Moses we know would have ever existed had he not been humble enough to listen to Jethro. Yeah. Or if he would have burned out. 
I've watched leaders do that. Yeah. I've watched leaders think they have to do it all themselves and nobody can do it as good as they can. They refuse to delegate. They refuse to share the burden and they flame out. Yeah. That's not and, best. Have, have you come to any conclusions? Cause to me, I always say, huh, I wonder how their childhood was. I wonder what they're trying to prove where there's this idea of, you know, if you don't mind speaking candidly, because honestly in a position now where I am managing you know, depending on the season, it could be several hundred people at a time. Um, I like knowing I can trust the people that are yes. my subordinates. I like knowing that if I'm gone, the show's going to still go on whether I'm here yes. or not. I feel comfortable knowing I don't have to worry and micromanage, right? Yes. Do you have a yes. theory on what's going on there <laughs> from your observations? You know, in, in working, and this is, this is particularly true among founders and entrepreneurs, I think, but but really, with all leaders, I think every leader is is tempted by this and can be drawn to this this idea that they have a cape hanging in their closet, and that you know they're the one who's the savior that's going to swoop in and save the day, uh, that nobody can do it like they can. Uh, that is a real temptation yep. for leaders, particularly with things they started themselves, hmm. uh, because they've always been the one who fixed it. They've always been the one who did it. Uh, the problem is that doesn't scale. It yeah. just, it simply doesn't scale. And what you have to learn to do is what Jethro told Moses to do, which is to delegate, to build a team of people that you pour into who are then able to extend your reach far beyond anything you could ever do alone. Yeah. That is a business principle. And the, and the interesting thing about this is that Jethro is called the priest of Midian, likely not a follower of Yahweh, right? He's yeah. likely like not at all on the same page as Moses religiously. And yet Moses, Moses takes his advice. Yeah. I talk often about the fact that you can learn from anybody. Sometimes you learn what not to do, but if you've got a teachable spirit, you learn to eat the fish and leave the bones. And as a follower of Jesus, obviously you pray about this before you do anything, which is what Jethro tells Moses to do. So interestingly, go to your God, seek him out on this. But if he, if he says, okay, this is what I would recommend, and Moses absorbs it, and he takes it, and he does it, and that extends his leadership influence until he is the leader we know today. Yeah, wow. That's so deep. Yeah, I hadn't thought about all. I mean, I put a lot of thought into the whole Jethro-Moses um, relationship and interaction, but but it it seems like that was the, the starting point because I go – to the book of John with Jesus, right? <laughs> Mary yeah. is there with Jesus at this, this marriage in Cana of Galilee, mm -hmm. right? And he had not been revealed yet. And right. his mother was the one who basically got that ball rolling. Yeah. And then the ministry started, right? Yeah. And um, it seems like even though Moses had been having his interactions, Jethro was that, that, that mentor he needed in that moment. And guess what? We all need that. We all need that. I've had a leadership coach for years because I need that. I need somebody to help me see what I can't see. I saw a study years ago that said every leader has statistically on average 3.6 blind spots. You know the funny thing about a blind spot? Hmm. You don't know you have it. <laughs> I need somebody to help me see what I can't see. Uh -huh. And that's what I love doing for leaders as a coach. Jethro is in many ways a model for what I do as a leadership coach. Hmm. Wow. I love that. And, and, you know, unfortunately I'm looking at the time we're we're running short on time here, but you've written a book. I mean, uh, so someone from the audience watching this episode, listening to it, you know, whatever form they're, they're, they're hearing this. Um, what what's the next steps they go to your website they reach out to you personally they get a consult please break that down a little bit if you don't mind sure you can go to my website it's catalyticleadership.net and find out more about the coaching that i provide you can sign up for a discovery call and that's where i will sit down with you or virtually of course and talk through what it is you're struggling with where you want to go and see if this is a good fit for us to work together uh, if you're interested in the book uh, published earlier this year, for your listeners, Stephen, I would love to give a free copy of this book that we put out earlier this year. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a summary of so many of the lessons that I've learned on my leadership journey and from coaching leaders for a couple of decades from their stories. So this is, this is a, a summary of that. I wrote it in such a way that I wanted it to feel like we're having coffee across the table. Awesome. And it's that conversational. 
because I want it to be accessible for any leader, no matter where they are, whether they're a young emerging leader who's just starting to step into this or somebody who's been leading for 40 years. What I've heard and learned from people who have read this so far is that both ends of that spectrum have found value in this because it's very practical. It's very honest. It's very real. Hmm. Wow. Wow. So your listeners, I would love to, if they go to catalyticleadershipbook.com uh, and they're willing to pay the shipping to help me get the book to them, I would love to give them a free copy of the book. Oh, that's awesome. So it's not just an ebook. It's the actual no. hard copy. That's really Actual awesome. hard copy. I want to put this in as many hands as I can because I want to help that's leaders awesome. get better. Okay. And this is one way I can do that. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you for sharing. Is there any advice you would have for the audience? Maybe they're aspiring entrepreneurs or want to get started. Anything you'd like to share for them? One of the things that, that has informed my journey throughout since I was 15 years old is this idea. I want to learn from as many leaders as I can, as much as I can, as often as I can. That has informed my way. So I have bought more coffees and lunches for leaders from leaders who are farther down the road than I am. Hmm so that I can sit down and ask them questions. And I always come prepared. I always come with questions that I can ask because I want to learn what I don't know. I'm not going to live long enough to make all the mistakes myself, right? I want to avoid as many ditches as I can, but that takes intentional effort. They don't come to me. I have to go to them. Wow. And that's something I still do to this day because I value that intentional learning posture, that teachable spirit. That has served me better as a leader than just about anything else. So I would highly recommend that. That's why I put that as the first chapter in the book, because it matters that much to me. Wow. All right. Well, well, thank you so much for, for everything. I'm, I'm really uh, blessed by this conversation. It's, it's exciting to see what the Holy Spirit's doing among yeah. the brethren, right? It's, it's, yeah. There, there's a number of us coming to the same conclusions and and getting a piece of the 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 the, the journey you know that God has for the body as a whole. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your story and, and joining us today, Stephen. It's been an honor, and I've loved hearing your story and what God's doing in you and through you. I think the best is yet to come. All right, Amen. I received that. Yes, sir. Now, would you mind uh, closing us out in a prayer, William? No, absolutely. Let's do it, Heavenly Father. What an honor and privilege it's been today to connect with a new brother. I love that. And I pray that our conversation will be helpful and useful to the people who will watch and hear it. Father, use this to bring encouragement, to bring hope, where there might be a flagging sense of that. Help it to bring some new information that might be needed in the next season. Father, I believe that there is no wasted experience in our lives that you can use anything, anything, if we have a teachable spirit and we'll learn from it. I pray that for each person who's watching and listening in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, sir, thank you so much again. And I really hope we're going to have more of these conversations as time moves forward. I would love that, Stephen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And to the audience, that concludes this episode of the KOG Entrepreneur Show. I want to thank you all for tuning in to to this episode, and I want to remind everybody all the time, the kingdom of God is within you always, so go be fruitful and multiply. God bless, and we'll see you next time.